Thank you. Gosh, thank you, Colonel Ellis, uh, to begin with for that um, incredibly generous introduction. Very late notice, Colonel Ellis responded to a request uh, of mine to come here tonight and launch the book, which he agreed to do, as I say, at very short notice. It meant that he had to read uh, the book whilst up in uh, the Kimberley doing uh, work up there. And I rather like the idea of somebody travelling to an incredibly remote part of the world uh, to read a book like this, um, because so much of this story is played out in incredibly remote places. I'm sure that was lost on Colonel Ellis, though, because I'm not sure it would have been particularly enjoyable to read it in those circumstances. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, thank you so much for that generous introduction. I didn't only want a senior serving member of the Australian Army Reserve, I also wanted somebody, uh, as he pointed out, who has a direct connection to the Royal Australian uh, Engineers Association because of the fact that Ian was, of course, a sapper in the Engineers Corps. So once again, thank you so much for being here at short notice. I can also say thank you to Humphrey Clegg for also at short notice hosting this event and doing so with his usual uh, style and class. Uh, can I say thank you to Judy Anderson and the team here at uh, Melbourne Grammar for making this venue available. The original intention was to do the launch across the road at the Shrine of Remembrance, but owing to the centenary uh, celebrations for next year's Anzac Day, uh, it wasn't available for me. And I thought we're better to do it then in the shadows of the Shrine of Remembrance and in my old school. Um, I have to say this place has undergone a bit of a facelift since I was last year. This is extraordinary. Um, and I, although it's not a competition, I have to say I think it's slightly superior in comfort to what was on offer in the Shrine last year. Um, but thank you, Judy. Thank you to Scott uh, and the team at the, uh, the Avenue for selling the book. And more generally, thank you all for, for coming in here tonight. One of the perks of what I get to do as an author is every so often uh, invite a whole lot of family and friends who I don't normally get to see in the normal humdrum of life that much. Uh, so it's a great excuse to me. And I know that I seem to coincide my book launches on uh, extremely cold nights. Um, <laughs> nevertheless, that hasn't been a deterrent and you've all shown up the book before, so thank you so much. Just finally on that note, I'd like to say thank you to a couple of teachers that are here. I won't mention them, but these people, I hold them responsible for inspiring me to become an author of books. They instilled in me a confidence to pursue that dream. And so therefore I hold them personally responsible for my life of financial destitution. <laughs> um, I just wish you'd told me to become an investment banker. <laughs> there are also some unfamiliar faces in this crowd tonight, ladies and gentlemen. People who uh, have a direct connection to this story because they are related to uh, or friends of key participants of this story, and some of them have come far and wide. For instance, there is uh, family representing Major Robert Risson, who would rise in rank considerably beyond Major, he is a Major in this book. He plays a very important part in the early stages of this story. He was the commanding officer of the 2nd and 3rd Field Company, which was Ian's unit. Uh, he would go on to become the commanding officer of the Royal Australian Engineers Corps. He's pictured here as a brigadier. Uh, observing his troops with that imperious stare as they conduct training manoeuvres uh, in Papua New Guinea. He served in North Africa and the Far East during the Second World War and enjoyed a stellar career in the military. Uh, that stellar career would continue in public life and one of the many, many uh, appointments that he held down uh, was the head of the Melbourne Tramways. And it was in that role, uh, through very clever and shrewd administration, that he secured the prosperity, really, of Melbourne's tram system. And here's a bit of trivia. The corner of Swanson and Elizabeth Street is the Robert Risson tra tram terminus, which I'm sure you've all got a tram from. So next time you're there, you have to give a tip to your head. This extraordinary man. Um, it's one of many memorials that were built, uh, or buildings and structures that were built in honour of, of this extraordinary man. There has also been an overwhelming response from the descendants of Major Raymond Binns, um, I was as recently as two days ago receiving an email from a nephew or a cousin uh, who was a couple of times removed from Major Raymond Binns that caught wind of the fact that this book was being launched and asked if he could come along uh, with Raymond Binns' children and grandchildren who are also here. And I said, he's more than welcome. You are all more than welcome. Major Binns was a significant doctor of note in Adelaide before and after the war. He would enlist in the AIF as a medical non-combatant at the outbreak of war and owing to his medical expertise, would be advanced to the rank of Major and become the commanding officer of the 2nd 8th Field Ambulance. Um, as luck or misfortune would have it, coincidentally he was ambushed in the same place on the same night as Ian was ambushed and taken prisoner of war in Libya. Major Binns, to his credit, managed to convince his German captors uh, to allow him and his subordinates to set up a field tent where he would tend to the wounded and undoubtedly he would save 
many lives. One of the lives that he saved, in fact, was a senior German officer who was brought towards Bins or in front of Bins with a severely wounded leg. In fact, his leg had been all but ripped apart after he was standing in the vicinity of an artillery shell and it exploded. Bins had no choice but to amputate the leg. He did so with a butcher's knife under a kerosene lamp in the middle of the desert. Uh, and he anaesthetised the patient with a bottle of whisky. He took off his leg, sewed him up, and then insisted upon this person being uh, evacuated immediately to the nearest hospital, which was in Tripoli, many hundreds of miles away. And Bins always wondered what actually happened to this person. He'd find out about 14 months later when he became the senior medical orderly of Campo 57, which was the same prisoner of war camp that Ian was uh, interned for a period of 18 months in 1942-43. On a June day in 1942, Major Binns was called out onto the parade ground in front of the entire prison camp population, which totaled about 3,000 prisoners at that point. He was called up the front and a convoy of long hooded black cars came up and stepping out of those cars were five officers. They were bearing the insignia of the German Africa Corps. One of them was on crutches with one leg. He made his way over the bins, put his hand in his pocket, and pulled out an iron cross, which he stuck on Bins's chest. It's one of very few examples of where Allied soldiers were awarded in this fashion by the German Wehrmacht. And it's a testament to the respect that Bins was held in by both the Allies and also the enemy. Bins reportedly turned around to some of his troops, some of whom uh, Ian was one of those people who heard him say that I will never declare this, I'll never wear it publicly, but I'll keep it as a symbol of all that we have suffered in this war. He was an extraordinary man. The very low mortality rate that uh, was recorded in that particular camp, notwithstanding the prisoners, was subjected to awful privations. One of the coldest winters in Italian history were regularly subjected to beatings, often placed on starvation rations. The fact that the mortality rate was so low is testament to his skill as a doctor, but also to his quality as a leader. It is a great pleasure to have Major Binz's family here to represent their extraordinary father. If I was overwhelmed by the response from Major Binz's family, then I'd be flabbergasted by the response from Ian Buse's family. There were originally 47 people coming, friends, family and loved ones, to support the launch of this book, which is essentially a book about Ian's life or his war experience. We lost a few numbers because apparently a bit of a lurgy has broken out in the Anzac Hotel where, uh, uh, Anzac House, where Ian is a resident. But nevertheless, they still showed up uh, in force. Thank you all so much for being here. I'd particularly like to thank Rod and Irene, uh, without whose support I wouldn't have been able uh, to put this book together. Rod is, is Ian's son, Irene is Rod's wife. Um, they facilitated interviews and made available to me an enormous amount of information that was crucial in forming the research uh, of this book. So thank you so much. And now for Ian Buse. What a great honour it was to meet this man. I'm here for my show. An inspiring man, and you get a sense of that when I talk about him uh, in this presentation when you read this book. He is an inspiration to me. Please make him welcome, Miss Ian Buse. Story. I first heard the name Ian Bust uh, on Anzac Day 2013, as he said, uh, during the broadcast of the Anzac Day Parade. And when that reporter put a microphone in Ian's face and offered him the opportunity to reflect on his wartime experience, uh, he touched on a, a number of extraordinary things. He said before in his, in his wonderful speech that um, he talked a bit about his escape out of the work camp in Vercelli. He also touched on an incident that happened or an experience that he had up in Munich towards the end of the war, where he would bear witness to the ter terrible bombing campaign of that city as the Allies brought the fight home into Germany. That was of particular interest to me because at this time I'd just finished up writing my previous book, which was about, as you may recall, a group of airmen stranded in Japanese-occupied Timor. And I learned from historians far more uh, esteemed than myself that air power and air superiority were the determining factors in winning the war. So suddenly my focus had turned from the war in the Pacific to what was happening to Euro in Europe after hearing Ian's 
uh, interview. I did a little bit of research uh, at first and learnt and was horrified and appalled and amazed at the, at the amount, the payload of bombs that were dropped on cities like Munich uh, at the end of the war. Now, to give you a sense of the sort of firepower to which Ian was exposed, I managed to get my hands on this uh, footage, which I'll turn it down for a second, which gives you a sense of the sort of, as I say, the firepower uh, to which Ian was exposed. This is stock footage of an unexploded bomb dropped on Munich in July 1944, being detonated in a safe demolition. The camera is about a mile set back from the mile uh, from the actual exploding bomb. There is a bit of an explosion here. Now what happens in the event of an unexploded bomb being discovered in a German city, which happens with alarming regularity, is that a highly trained bomb disposal unit is sent in and uh, an area about a mile around the bomb is evacuated and a highly absorbent material is placed over the bomb. That is precisely what happened here. Notwithstanding that material being placed over the bomb, you can still see the incredible yield, the explosive force of this bomb as it was being detonated. This was a single 550-pound caliber bomb that was dropped on Munich in the month of July 1944. There were one million bombs in that month alone that were dropped on Munich, and Ian was there throughout that entire experience. I had to interview this man, I had to ask him about that experience specifically. Unfortunately for me, Bust is not a common name in the white pages. <laughs> I managed to track down his son Rod on the second row and we teed up a time to meet and I began a journey with Ian that would last me for seven months. And very quickly I discovered that Ian's experience in Munich was but one of countless extraordinary experiences he had during World War II. We would begin here at Caulfield Racecourse at a time when the Caulfield Racecourse had been repurposed to serve as a recruitment depot. This painting hangs in the Australian War Memorial. Ian would tell me about the excitement of being enlisted in the uh, second, third field company, a unit in the sixth division in the Royal Australian Engineers Corps. There he is, looking as frightened as ever, second row from the front, furthest to the right. He would tell me about the thrill of travelling aboard the Mauritania, one of the great ocean liners of the day, refitted to serve as a troop ship transporting troops from Australia to the European front. Uh, this is the Mauritania dressed up in a war paints heading up the River Clyde towards Glasgow. Ian was aboard this ship when this photo was taken. He would tell me about the wonderful experience of travelling in the Million Dollar Convoy, so-called the Million Dollar Convoy because it contained some of the greatest ships of the age. The Mauritania, the Aquitania, the Empress of China, the Empress of Japan, the Empress of Britain and many more besides. You can see that it was also escorted by several of the great destroyers and light cruisers and heavy cruisers of the day, but none more famous than the HMS Hood, the mighty Hood, which Ian saw only a few months before she was sunk by the Bismarck. He told me about the thrill and excitement of putting in these incredibly exotic ports, including here at Sierra Leone, uh, where the, the boys, Ian included, would come up with a fairly inventive way of filling up the ship's galley. That bucket on the left is, has money inside and it's been lowered away to these local traders in exchange for fruit and vegetables. And then he took me to Britain during its darkest hour. Now, I should say from the outset that although Ian took some great photos, this iconic photo was not one of his photos that he took. It is St Paul's Cathedral uh, standing defiant the morning after a Luftwaffe bombing campaign. But Ian may not have taken this photo, but he was in some of these buildings, in the basements of some of these buildings as London was burning. He bore witness to the Battle of Britain. Then we went to North Africa on the back of his BSA motorcycle, the dispatch rider in the second and third field company, and then eventually on to North Africa, where Ian would serve under this man, General Sir Archibald Wavell, in Wavell's Western Desert Force. This for me is where the story really begins. In a time and a place where North Africa was largely under the sway of the great European powers of the day. Egypt uh, was of course a British mandate, and Libya was part of the Italian Kingdom. Wavell's orders were clear. He was to win back territory that had been lost to the Italian 10th Army in Western Egypt and then pushed the Italian 10th Army right back up to Tripoli over in the West, which was then and now uh, the capital of Libya. Ian would see action and service outside some of the most iconic cities and places in Australian military history. Badia, Tabruk, Derna, Benghazi, Ajadabia, al Ahalia. And you can see after two months of fighting in, Western Desert, in the Western Desert Force, 
The complexion of the North Africa ch campaign has changed somewhat. The Italian 10th Army has been all but annihilated. Over 130,000 Italians were taken prisoner of war, notwithstanding the fact that Wavell's force was outnumbered three to one. Among those prisoners of war was the Italian 10th Army's last commanding officer, General Bergenzoli, Barba Electrica, electric whiskers. So it's called because of that magnificent bushy moustache. Not a great commanding officer, I'm afraid. Ian was dug in at this time, at the end of the Western Desert Campaign, at El Achalia, with his unit, the 2nd 3rd Field Company. I marked it there, obviously, with the yellow arrow. This marked the extreme western edge of Wavell's advance into Libya. But over the other side of the Mediterranean, in the heart of the Third Reich, darker forces were at play to turn the tide in North Africa. The goal of the Axis powers was the Suez Canal. It represented an incredibly vital shipping port, port or, or canal or shipping route that would connect the Far East right round to Europe. It would only increase in, in importance as the war progressed. Hitler wanted the Suez Canal for himself, but he knew that kicking the British out of Egypt would be no easy feat. He needed to call on his best general. So that is precisely what he would do. General later Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, perhaps one of history's greatest tank and infantry commanders, the Desert Fox, as he would become known. Rommel's orders were clear. Take back the territories lost in Libya, keep the British out of Egypt, and take Suez. He would waste no time. This footage here uh, is footage of Rommel's forces entering El Ahaliya only two days after Ian's unit left that part of the world. You'll see Rommel come up in a second here with a pair of binoculars. The Desert Fox overseeing the advance uh, onto Al Ahalia. There he is there. And you'll also see an incredibly powerful weapon, this one here. This was known as an 88mm anti aircraft gun that was quite brilliantly repurposed by Ronald to serve as an anti tank gun. You need to remember that making model of weapon because it's crucial, plays a crucial role in the circumstances that gave rise to Ian's incarceration as a prisoner of war. After two months of fighting again, the tide had changed in North Africa. Rommel had taken El Ahalia at Jadavia, Benghazi, and was looking on to, the, to uh, Derna and had his eyes on Tobruk as well. While this was all happening, Ian and his unit had fallen back to a small part of the world on the outskirts of Tobruk, which I've marked there with the yellow arrow. More specifically, he was holed up in this abandoned hospital a hospital that had been built by the Italians and, as you can see, operated by the Red Cross. Now, the rules, according to the Geneva Convention, prohibited any attack against any building that had the banner of the Red Cross, which meant it was also prohibited to repurpose these buildings for the use of barracks or an advanced operational base or military headquarters or whatever. If you did that, then you would have to paint over those Red Cross signs. So what do you do when literally thousands of highly trained, highly disciplined infantrymen in the Africa Corps under, under one of history's greatest generals is bearing down directly on your position? Well, in Ian's case, you paint beer commercials. <laughs> These were the famous murals that were painted over the Red Cross, and Ian was among three men to do it. There he is there on the left pretending to hold that pint of beer. <laughs> These are highly recognisable advertisements. Here's another one here. 9,356 and a quarter miles from the nearest Griffiths Park Square. <laughs> they were iconic symbols to the retreating Australian Imperial Force of the 6th Division. 6th Division. A bit of a morale burst, a slice of Australia in the desert wastes of eastern Libya. Now, at this point, Ian could reasonably have expected to be evacuated back to Tobruk or beyond to Alexandria, but the war had different plans. He would be among 60 others to be sent out on an incredibly dangerous mission, a mission that would unfold inside of that black box. The mission, this is an enlarged uh, map of that area. The mission had two elements. The first element was to draw, destroy a section of road between Derna and Tobruk. The aim of that to being to effectively slow down Ronald's advance east into Egypt. The second part of that mission was to destroy an enormous Italian munitions dump. Munitions dump that contained high-caliber explosives, high-caliber bombs, uh, ammunition, weapons, fuel, you name it. Given that it couldn't be taken back with the retreating forces, Wavell wanted it destroyed. Ian was among those 60 men to carry out those two missions. They set off at daybreak on the 6th of April 1941 from the hospital that I marked with the White Arrow. And on the way to Tamimi, they were strafed by three German, uh, German Messerschmitts and two Stuka dive bombers. Incredibly, nobody was killed in that action. 
uh, but they did lose a truck. The convoy of 12 trucks continued on and stopped where I've marked approximately at that yellow arrow. At this point, they came across a part of the coastal road that connected dirt down right through to Tobruk that consisted of six hairpin bends that went up a cliff face. It was deemed the most appropriate place to destroy the coastal road because it could effectively create, with high explosive ammunition, a landslip, which is exactly what they would do, rendering the road not only destroyed but impossible to repair. 30 men were tasked to that particular job. The other 30, Ian included, would continue on to Derna. They would make it to the eastern edge of Derna after nightfall. They found the munitions dump, attached charges, and briefly turned the desert night into day as they set off that explosive charge. The mission was complete. Now all they needed to do was get back to Tobruk. The problem, of course, was that the coastal road was down. So they'd lost the eastern route back to Tobruk, which meant that they had to go into Derna, take the southern road to Michelli, and then turn east to Tamimi. This was a highly hazardous exercise. At this point, Rommel's forces were at the western gate of Derna. And in fact, Ian can recall hearing the exchange of mortar fire between a British armoured brigade at the western edge of Derna and Rommel's forces. They made it through Derna and headed along the southern road and drove through the night until they came to the Wadi El Fatah that I've marked there with the blue arrow. This is where the southern road from Derna to Michelli enters a depression. A wadi is an Arab word that effectively describes a depression in the desert. They were met there by a British officer and a great sense of relief swept through the convoy. Clearly, Michelli had not fallen to the Germans. Ian remembers driving in that convoy, second truck from the front, entering the desert was at Wadi. He could see the sand dunes that marked out the top of the depression, dimly lit in the starlight against the desert sky. And then all at once, the truck directly in front of him exploded and keeled over onto its side. At first, Ian thought that it had struck a mine, but he quickly changed his mind when he heard the sound of machine gun fire and German voices screaming at him to halt. It was an ambush. It had become known as the infamous ambush of the Wadi El Fatah. The reason that it was infamous was because that British officer was in fact a German officer in disguise. That was prohibited against the rules of the Geneva Convention, but there you go. Hundreds of Allied soldiers were taken prisoner in that fashion over two nights, Ian among them, as indeed was Major Binns. As Ian was led away from his truck, a German soldier leant in towards him and whispered the words that no Allied soldier ever wanted to hear. For you, the war is over. Little did that German soldier know that Ian's war wasn't over. In fact, it had only just begun. Now, to find out what happens next, you're going to have to buy a copy of the book. Um. <laughs> Needless to say, this is a story of incredible courage and fortitude, <coughs> heroics, adventure, resilience, mateship, gallantry, and, of course, of escape. But it would be wrong to characterise this story simply as a boy's own adventure, to give everyone the impression that this was some sort of Indiana Jones story of a guy running around the Western Desert and jumping out of jails. There is also tragedy in this story, and I got a sense of that when Ian would begin each of our conversations by saying that one of his greatest gifts, which was his memory and the ability to recall in vivid detail what happened to him seven years ago, was also his greatest curse, because it was a nightmare at times to have to relive the horrors that happened to him in World War II. I came to understand that when I saw the fear come into his eyes when he described being strafed by German Messerschmitts or dive bombed by Stuka dive bombs. I saw him clutch at his sides in agony when he relived the pain of dysentery and desert fever in the Western Desert. I could see the horror come across his face when he was clapped in irons for 28 days, put on starvation rations and not being able to move for a month in his desert kit during one of the coldest winters in Italian history. That's a shirt and shorts. And I saw tears went up well up when he relived the loss of friends, like a friend who was in this truck when it struck a mine and his legs were ripped apart and he died in agony. And finally, I saw him cry when he relived the horror of losing one of his best mates, a prisoner of war, who was ripped apart in the bombing campaign of Munich. But there are heroics. There are high adventures, as demonstrated by this group or members of this group. This is a photo of a work camp in Vercelli where Ian was sent uh, towards the end of 19, halfway through 1943. This photo was taken before he arrived. But some of these people would plan and execute and escape with Ian that he touched on during his story. Part of that escape involved walking over 600 kilometres down the Apennine mountain range. I used to see tears come into his eyes, not tears of pain, but tears of joy, recalling what he regarded as one of the most beautiful countries that he has ever seen. 
This is a small section of some of the countryside that Ian had to traverse in order to make it to safety. I saw him get excited reliving the thrill of visiting places that he, as a young boy growing up in the Great Depression, would never have dreamed of visiting. Places like Benghazi, Alexandria and Cairo, but also places that we take for granted, like Cape Town, London and Glasgow. And finally, I saw him laugh uproariously, reliving the thrill of the, 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 the little things in life when a Red Cross parcel was delivered. Ian's favourite food was that um, tin of Scotch herrings and tomato sauce, which doesn't sound particularly appetising to me, but you can understand as a prisoner of war, the arrival of a Red Cross parcel like this would put a smile on anyone's face. Ian regards the Red Cross as the organisation that kept him and so many others alive during his prisoner of war experience. And then there's the sadness and the nostalgia at reliving the names and faces of men with whom Ian served. Names and faces of people that are fresh to Ian today as they were when he first met them over 70 years ago. Ian is the last person alive of this story. All of the people that came into his orbit during the war are either deceased or died during the war itself. He is the sole survivor of this story. Its value to me is not simply that Ian lived an experience that encompasses five years and over two months of service abroad, as Humphrey said in the introduction, which largely encompasses Australia's involvement in World War II. Nor is it just that he happened to bear witness to or participate in some of the most iconic moments in World War II history, the Battle of Britain, fighting in the Western Desert, the North Africa campaign, the prisoner of war experience in Italy, the Battle of Monte Cassino, the prisoner of war experience in Germany, the bombing of Munich and the bombing of Germany and much else besides. To me, the value of this story is the human element. It's a reminder to my generation, I think, that in living memory there exists a generation of young men, once young men, who were forced to cross the threshold into manhood along a rite of passage that was marked with conflict, loss and extreme violence. Ian took me on that journey, and I think that journey is beautifully demonstrated in these two photos. Here we have the young man of barely 22 years of age, just prior to his embarkation, so shy that he can't even look at the camera. Then you have the battle-hardened veteran of World War II, the ex-prisoner of war, who never, despite the horrors that he experienced, lost that smile which he's brought along with him tonight as well. That smile is the mark of a man of relentless optimism. It was that optimism that saw him through the, world, the Second World War. I've said before that he's a remarkable man. He's an inspiration. It's a great honour to have met him and a great privilege to have had the opportunity to write the story of his life. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for coming.